Hello, everyone, and happy Tuesday. If you're a regular listener, then you know we normally drop our episodes on Monday mornings. As far as the one-day delay, I can only say sorry. We've been balancing a number of deadlines recently and doing the best we can. And for what it's worth, we're hoping some of the projects we've been working on outside of the podcast, and that contributed to our tardiness, will catch your attention. First, we've received word from Amazon that Kindle Vela, the new storytelling app that allows authors to tell stories in a serialized format, is going to go live this week. That means that the first seven chapters of our story, Queens of Blood, are going to be waiting for you to come read in just a few days. Each chapter is between three to 5,000 words, so we've published somewhere in the range of twenty to 30,000 words overall so far. Considering that a typical novel is about 100,000 words, that means we're about a quarter of the way to a full fiction book for you, focusing on the exploits of our favorite duo from season one of the podcast, Fredegunda and Brunhilde. If you found yourself wondering how these ladies got from one crazy episode to the next as we laid out the facts given to us in the history books, well, join along as we imagine what had to have happened to these women to get them from point A to point B and beyond. It's a wickedly fun story, so please check out the new Kindle Vela app and give Queens of Blood a try. The first three chapters are free to check out, so there's absolutely nothing to lose. New chapters will post each Wednesday, so join us for that. The second big announcement this week comes to us courtesy of academia.edu. I've used academia a ton to research papers for this show, and to be honest, we probably wouldn't exist without the sources they've made available for TNM. That being said, academia is standing up a new feature, Academia Courses, and they've asked yours truly to make a few videos for them. The first commissioned course is called Life After Rome, and we'll look back at the late days of the Western Roman Empire the emperors who led while the power of the empire faded, the barbarian tribes and the leaders who filled the vacuum left by the disappearance of Rome, the events that signaled the end of days, and the groups, like the Merovingians and Franks, who thanks to the influence of a few centuries of fighting alongside and against the legions, as well as trading with them, rose to power. We'll have a total of seven 12-minute-ish long videos covering this topic, and we'll be sure to let you know when they're released so you can check them out. We're looking to do several more courses after this, so check out Life After Rome on Academia Courses, and then stay tuned. All of this is being said so you can enjoy new content and support the show. For two years now, we've given our heart and soul into bringing you the best podcast we can, and we feel like we've grown a ton along the way. If you've enjoyed Thugs and Miracles, check out these other offerings as well. We'll put the links up in the show notes and plug them on social media. Check them out, share them, and let people who share your passion for history in the Middle Ages know about us. We're incredibly excited about all these opportunities and hope that you'll enjoy them too. So check out Kindle Vela and Academia Courses once you're done listening here. All right, enough plugs. It's time to get back to the 8th century and the story you've been waiting for. It's time to get on with the show. Charles Martel had been busy. In the five years since he'd beaten back the Umayyad incursion into Francia, Charles had taken his forces into areas they could only have dreamed of in the early days of his ascendancy, when their leader had been locked up as a prisoner of his jealous stepmother. Now, long out of prison and arguably the strongest military leader the Franks had ever known to this point, Charles had not only stopped the incursion of the Umayyads, but he had turned the tables on them by chasing them back to the south. He destroyed their strongholds in multiple cities along the way. He engaged them in battle yet again in Nîmes. He wasn't quite able to push them entirely out of Francia, but by 737, he had pushed them down to Septimania in the areas historically held by the now defunct Visigoths. Beyond the Umayyads, Charles had managed to gain control over many of the groups he had fought with for years in the north and the east. He established his dominance over the Bavarians, the Alemanni, and the Frisians, and he maintained his place over them not just through the use of military power, but spiritual power as well. He acted as protector to the Catholic missionary Boniface, who, in turn, evangelized great swaths of Germania. His efforts against the Umayyads and his support for Boniface had gained the attention of the Pope, Gregory III, who was himself struggling against the Byzantine Emperor and the Lombards. Through Charles' military prowess and the Pope's need for somebody, anybody, to help him survive, 
Charles had put the kings of the Franks on the path to being the protectors of the faith. In the midst of all of this, Charles never served as king. He was the prince of the Franks, a duke, but he never attempted to usurp the crown itself, despite everyone in the world knowing who truly wielded power in Francia. No, Charles deferred to his king, the young man he himself had placed on the throne, and he did so all the way until the day came when word was received that Thederic IV, king of all the Franks, and still only in his mid-twenties, had died, quietly and unexpectedly, in his lodgings at the Abbey of Shell. The news forced Charles to make a decision. Who should he next place on the throne? It was a loaded question. You see, Charles had been able to avoid a lot of problems thanks to Thederic. The boy, only eight years old when he had the crown held above his head, had been an easy puppet for Charles to control. The child was too young to know any better, and he had no parents trying to assert themselves as regents. He'd been locked away in the abbey and schooled, his classes if you should call them that, consisting of various teachers praising Charles Martel and telling the king that his current way of doing business was the way it had always been and always would be. The king's job was to be a symbol to his people, not an actual leader. God, no. That's what Charles was there for. For almost two decades, Charles had been able to devote almost no time or energy at all to having to think about the sovereign. The king existed. A Merovingian held power. This seemed to be enough for the people. They didn't need the resurrection of a Clovis or a Clothar. They just needed one of those men's divinely placed descendants to hold the title. The thing was, however, the people seemed to care less and less about this with every year that passed and every battle Charles won. He was the leader. He was the one being showered with praise and being given powerful monikers. No Umayyad commander quaked in fear at the thought of facing Thederic IV in the field, but they turned tail and ran if they knew Charles was leading the opposing forces. Despite all of this, Charles was reluctant to try and simply take the title of king away from the young man whose divine lineage entitled him to that position. It had been only 75 years since Charles' great-uncle Grimwald had made a play to take the throne, a play that cost him and his son, Charles's first cousin once removed, their lives. In that case, however, the circumstances were different. With Grimwald, he made an active attempt to usurp the throne. He'd sent the rightful claimant, King Sigebert the Third's son Dagobert, into exile. He then tried to place his son, Childebert, on the throne under the guise that Sigebert had adopted him years earlier. The attempted veneer of legitimacy was ludicrous and short-lived. Grimwald and Childebert were deposed by 662. Charles, though time had passed and he had no natural heir such as Dagobert II to raise to power, didn't want to tempt fate when everything else about his position and authority was unquestioned. He took several days to think about the problem as the Derek's body was prepared for burial and laid to rest. Here's the thing. Once the Derek was interred, there was no hue and cry from the people, from anyone, to put another king in place. The last one had been so meek and quiet as to render him forgettable, and Charles took note of the lack of emotion that accompanied the death of the monarch. If no one wanted another Merovingian, then why should he spend time and energy trying to manufacture a Merovingian? Charles tried to place the decision he needed to make into the context of a battle, to picture the problem in the same way he visualized his position against the Umayyads on the battlefield of Poitiers five years earlier. In that case, he had had great success by establishing a firm and unassailable position and then allowing the enemy to tire themselves by throwing themselves repeatedly into it with no effect. Could he treat this decision on the king in much the same way, to simply take a strong position and then wait for a challenger, if there even was one, to waste themselves trying to assail him? Was his position to take the crown of power for himself? No, he thought. There's no reason to risk the crown. I gain nothing but a title by doing that, when my true goal is to hold power and rule. If I take the crown, I alienate my position. If I do nothing, then my enemies have to waste their energy to attack me. Let them come. With this thought, Charles chose, just as he had in the early days leading to the Battle of Poitiers, to do nothing. If his concern was to see how people would react to a Merovingian being out of power, then why not let the world experience life without a Merovingian? He could act through omission, 
by not placing a new king. If there was an outcry, it would be quashed easily enough by finding a new one. He'd done it multiple times before, so he had no worries about his ability to do it again. But only if he had to. A week after Thederic had been buried, Charles strode into his first council meeting without an acknowledged king and got to business ruling Francia. No one said anything on that day, or any of the days that would follow. In 737, nearly three centuries into the reign of the Merovingian dynasty, Francia went about its day-to-day business without a king. For Francia, Charles was all that was needed. And so began the Interregnum. This is Thugs and Miracles. Season 2, Episode 21, Interregnum. Alright, welcome back. As always, I'm Benjamin Bernier, and this week the show that purports to look at history through the eyes of the kings and queens of France is going to be just a little bit blind, because with the death of Thederic IV, we have no king, we have no queen, and we have no heir apparent. In the nearly 300 years this show has covered to date, we've had plenty of problems with too many people wanting to be king. We've seen civil wars, usurpations, murdered relatives, executions, and God knows what else. What we absolutely have not had to deal with is no one stepping up to the position. But that's exactly what Charles Martel did when Thederic died in 737. By not taking the crown, he put himself in a position where he was unquestionably the most powerful man in Francia, the position that should arguably belong to the king. But by not taking the scepter or being crowned, he avoided all of the shenanigans that come with the position. So for the rest of this episode, we're going to look at just what Charles accomplished after he stopped the Umayyad advance in 732, and then we're going to consider the logic and efficacy of Charles' decision of omission. Was he crazy to avoid this honor, or was he smart to avoid it like the plague? Was Charles a middle-aged Cincinnatus, a medieval George Washington, turning away the trappings of power? Or was he simply taking on all of the power that Franzi had to offer? with none of the risks. So, what happened after 732 in the Battle of Poitiers? For a closer discussion of the topic, I turn to historian Eric Greek. Quote, The Umites clearly learned from their defeat at Tours. From the security of Avignon, they could raid the surrounding countryside with relative impunity. It would be incumbent upon the Franks to come to them and remove them from their fortified positions. The previous weakness of not knowing where or when the Franks mobilized was effectively negated. When the Franks did come and lay siege, as the Umayyads had at the Battle of Toulouse, the Franks would find themselves vulnerable to a relief force crossing from Spain or landing in the port of Narbonne. The Umayyads further strengthened their position by allying with local nobles eager to break from Odo. When the Franks mobilized their forces, the Umayyads retreated into Avignon to await reinforcement. Charles promptly as predicted by the Umayyads, laid siege to Avignon. With the siege established, the Franks gathered their forces and prepared them for a direct assault upon the outnumbered Umayyads. The Franks, certainly surprising the Umayyads, succeeded in capturing Avignon, and this time the Umayyad force appears to have been utterly destroyed. Charles proceeded to drive south and lay siege to Narbonne itself, before plundering the surrounding lands of those who had allied with the Umayyads. Even these victories, though arguably much more significant than Tours, do not appear to have decisively deterred the Umayyads from further encroachment. Narbonne and Septimania were still in Umayyad hands, and whenever the Umayyads could raise another force, they would almost certainly return. End quote. Fredegar, the contemporary historian of Charles Martel, tells us much the same story as Greek, but does so in a much more laudatory manner. Rather than talking about surprising the Umayyads, Fredegar tells us that Charles was, quote, always guided and supported by Christ, who decides the battles. End quote. At this point, Charles was incredibly potent, and it would certainly have been desirable, from the Frankish point of view, to believe that God was on their side. But realistically, 
there were two things playing into Charles's hands at this point besides just his formidable martial prowess. The first of these was geography. To break into Francia, the Umites had to either traverse the Pyrenees, cross on the water over the Mediterranean or the Atlantic, or maneuver through the relatively narrow choke point of Septimania. This strip of land, right at the current border of France and Spain, is the only easily traversed point between the mountains and the sea. Long story short, for the Umayyads to resupply arms and soldiers, they either needed to conduct an amphibious landing, a mountain journey, both of which would have greatly limited the amount of supplies they could bring, or come through the pass in Septimania. Charles, on the other hand, had home field advantage. He could resupply from all of his lands and without having to deal with natural restrictions. However, if he ever tried to go south to Narbonne and Septimania, he'd put himself in the same position as the Umayyads coming north. Hence his reluctance to go much further south. Check out this passage from De Meseret that pretty succinctly wraps up what happened. Quote, The team, governor of Narbonne, and perhaps of all that country for the Saracens, was gotten into the town. Those in Spain, informed of the danger the place was in, made great levies of soldiers and put them aboard some vessels to relieve it. There is a lake between Narbonne and Vilsalce, at whose mouth the little river of Bear discharges itself into the sea. It is called the Lake Oliver, where it was their boats came into land, those forces they had brought. Amaros, governor of Tarragon, was their general. Martel, leaving his brother with part of the army to maintain the siege of Avignon, went thither to them and gave them battle. It was very obstinate, but in the conclusion, Amaros was overthrown upon huge heaps of his slain men and most of the rest that fled into their boats, drowned, or put to the sword. A team's courage increased by this ill success, and he defended himself so bravely that Charles left him there, turning his forces toward more easy conquests. End quote. Realistically, it's hard to believe Charles would have left a team in Narbonne if he could have extracted him, even with great difficulty. Geography favored the defense of Narbonne, and Charles almost certainly understood that the price of victory would have been too high at that time. He also would have realized that any Umayyads in Francia were now cut off from reinforcements, so long as a court could be held in Narbonne. Charles moved off to conduct mop-up operations and remove any forces who could cause trouble internally or hit his forces from the rear. Narbonne and areas to the south would have to wait until another day. The second thing playing to Charles' advantage, in which he likely didn't fully know or understand, was the internal unrest of the Berber forces fighting for the Umayyads. Again from Greek, quote, Before the year was out, the Umayyads had already raised another force and were heading toward Gaul when news of a Berber rebellion in Tangier reached the governor of Al-Andalus, Uqba ibn al-Hajjaj. To what extent this force compelled Charles to abandon the siege of Narbonne, or whether the ever rest of Frisians and Saxons compelled a redistribution of Frankish force is unknown. When Charles abandoned the siege of Narbonne, the Umayyads clearly believed that they could maintain their positions with little effort while they focused on restoring the rest of Berbers to their ranks. As with Menuz's previous Barber rebellion in Catalonia, the bulk of the Berber ranks remained loyal to the Caliphate. Ukba proceeded to Tangier and brutally crushed the revolt, instituting a military occupation of Morocco that kept the estranged Berber tribe safely out of areas critical to the Umayyads. For the Umayyads, it's clear that the rebellious Berbers were a greater threat than the Franks. End quote. If Charles believed Narbonne was a sort of cork holding back the Umayyads, well, the Umayyads likely felt the same way about Charles. Time was on their side, or so they believed, so why not deal with internal issues before turning toward more external conquest? Charles had similar thoughts and issues, and spent the rest of his life taking back towns, getting retribution from treasonous governors, most notably Marontis, governor of Marseille, who de Mesere tells us tried to, quote, make himself independent, crave the assistance of the Saracens, and deliver the city of Avignon up to them, end quote. Charles also worked to subdue unrest in the tribes he had conquered. For some reason, the Frisians, Saxons, and Bavarians didn't like a hostile outside force raiding their lands and attempting to sway their people to a new religion. Weird. Of course, all this is happening without even a tiny bit of input from the Merovingian king. The Derek IV isn't a puppet. He's a non-entity. Charles at this time is raising armies and riding from the North Sea to the Mediterranean. He's receiving embassies from the Pope. He is, I like to say, an accidental usurper. He was successful beyond imagination, 
It is hard to believe that when he set out, he did so with the idea that he would become the de facto king by becoming the strongest military leader yet known to the Franks. Yet that's exactly what happened, and exactly why, when Thederic died in or around 738, there was no clamor to replace him immediately. Instead of the king is dead, long live the king, the Franks did a collective, the king is dead, meh. This, I would argue, was the end of the Merovingian dynasty. There is a final Merovingian king who will sit the throne eventually, but for the next few years, there was none. And the interregnum doesn't seem to have had any ill effect on the administration of government. It would only be after Charles' death, when the usual vultures started to hover about, looking for a piece of carcass, that the quote-unquote need for a king would be revisited. So, what did Charles do without a king? Well, some very significant events occurred as a result of Martel's unrestrained hand in terms of diplomacy and internal administration. Looking first at diplomacy, you remember Morontis, the governor of Marseille who I mentioned about three or four minutes ago? Well, according to de Mesere, this treasonous governor tried to get an army of Umayyads back into Francia in 739, and when they arrived, they made their way around Provence and into the town of Arles. Charles, now into his third decade of fighting on either side of Francia, reached out to King Leuprand of the Lombards for a little help with the situation. According to de Mesere, quote, Leutprand, who did not desire to have the Umayyads so near Italy, and who besides was a friend to Martel, presently marched to join him. The infidels dare not stay for them, but retreats in our bone without striking a blow. Morontis likewise forsakes Marseille and retires amongst the rocks, so that Provence remained peaceably in the hands of the French. End quote. Now, any general will tell you that the best fight possible is the one where you don't actually need to strike a blow to get the result you want. For Charles, having the Umides run off allowed him to solidify ties with his southeastern neighbor and remove a thorn in his side in the form of Morontis. Not a bad one-two punch. As for internal administration, well, here's where things get messy. Because here's the thing. Wars cost money, and Charles had done nothing since he'd become the prince-slash-duke-slash-mayor of the Franks, except fight wars. When these battles were existential, such as the initial civil wars and the later struggle against the Umayyads, creditors may have been willing to let things slide, but now that things were a little more peaceful, payment was coming due. Additionally, since most of Charles's creditors were also his lords and the people he counted on to have his back, he needed to work out how they would receive compensation. Guizot explains how he accomplished this. Quote, the ordinary revenues of Charles Martel clearly could not suffice for so many expeditions and wars. He was obliged to attract or retain by rich presents, particularly by gifts of lands, the warriors, old and new ludes, who formed his strength. He therefore laid hands on a great number of the domains of the church and gave them, with the title of benefices, in temporary holding, often converted into proprietorship and under the style of precarious tenure, to the chiefs in his service. There was nothing new in this. The Merovingian kings and the mayors of the palace had more than once thus made free with ecclesiastical property. But Charles Martel carried this practice much farther than his predecessors had. He did more. He sometimes gave his warriors ecclesiastical offices and dignities. His liege Milo received from him the archbishoprics of Reims and Trove, and his nephew Hugh those of Paris, Rouen, and Bayeux, and the abbeys of Fontenelle and Jumiège. The church protested with all her might against such violations of her mission and her interest, her duties and her rights. She was so specially set against Charles Martel that, more than a century after his death, in 858, the bishops of France, addressing themselves to Louis the Germanic on this subject, wrote to him, quote, San Eucharias, Bishop of Orléans, who now reposeth in the monastery of saint Trudon, being at prayer, was transported into the realms of eternity. And there, amongst other things which the Lord did show unto him, he saw Prince Charles delivered over to the torments of the damned in the lowest regions of hell. And San Eucharias, demanding of the angel, his guide, what was the reason thereof? The angel answered that it was by sentence of the saints whom he had robbed of their possessions, and who, at the day of the last judgment, will sit with God to judge the world. End quote and end passage. 
One has to wonder if Dante read this letter at some point before he put ink to paper as he captured the details of his trip through hell along with the poet Virgil. But I digress. Getting back to Charles, it shows just how upset the church in Francia was about his dispensations that they would have him, the man who turned back the Muslim invaders, who forcibly turned the pagans in Germany to Christianity, and who offered support to St. Boniface to maximize his potential as missionary and archbishop in that same country, that they would have him roasting in the lowest levels of hell. I guess he can't please everyone. One thing that saved Charles from taking even more abuse for his actions with church property was something completely outside of his control, but that worked entirely to his benefit. You see, the popes, both Gregory II and the III, had found themselves in the same general time having a bit of a beef with the Byzantine emperor, Leo III. The eastern and western halves of the church were having some issues, and this honestly would be a trend that will continue all the way until 30 November of 2020, literally less than a year ago. Anyway, they were having some issues when Leo decided that iconoclasm, a fancy way for saying that religious images and the devotion to them would be banned, would be the new rule for the church. Well, the problem was, or at least a part of the problem, was that a lot of people, and especially those in monastic communities, were really attached to these images. More than that for the popes, the ability of the Byzantine emperor to make such wide-reaching declarations completely undercut the authority of the papacy and demanded a response. In an anchorman-like, that escalated quickly, turn of events, Gregory II rejected Leo's effort to impose iconoclasm upon Byzantine-controlled areas of Italy, which in turn caused Leo to stop sending money to the papacy and to take away churches from papal jurisdiction. Gregory II died in the midst of all of this, and his replacement, Gregory III, got to pick up right where G2 left off. And according to de Maizere, he came strong. He excommunicated Leo, then turned to Charles Martel in a bid for support. And as an aside, this is a huge indicator of just how powerful a force the Franks had become by this point, that they could be considered in any way as a contender with the Byzantine Empire. Well, this would have been great, but the Pope dug himself into an even worse position a few years later, when he basically gave papal cover to a couple of dukes who had taken a swing at King Leuprint of the Lombards. And now the king, in 740, seized towns within the Duchy of Rome to go ahead and retaliate. Once again, G3 was firing off letters and gifts to Charles Martel, calling him his most excellent son and giving him the titles of sub-king and viceroy and the most Christian. If that wasn't enough, the Pope sent an embassy in which he made presents of the keys of the sepulchre of St. Peter and the bonds that St. Peter had been tied with. He then added more titles for Martel, this time conferring on him the sovereignty of Rome and the title of patrician. Now, Charles and Leoprind were allies, so Charles wasn't about to declare war on behalf of the Pope. He did, however, send an embassy to Italy to meet and mediate with the Lombards and the Pope. While the embassy was of limited use, it seems to have been enough to cool the situation and allow both sides to eventually make up. Guizot notes the tightrope Martel was walking. He sent his ambassadors, quote, with instructions to offer King Leoprind rich presents and to really exert themselves with the King of the Lombards to remove the dangers dreaded by the Holy See. He wished to do something in favor of the papacy to show sincere goodwill without making his relations with useful allies subordinate to the desires of the Pope. End quote. All right, that's it for this week. Charles is now a victor over the pagans and the Muslim invaders. He's a protector of the Catholic Church, while at the same time a friend to the Lombard king. He's about to enter a period of relative calm and peace, a time wherein he can see the fruits of his labor come to fruition and he can guide his legacy. Or not. Now, Charles Martel is just about to end his time in our narrative. As a guy who began his ascendancy as a 20-something in prison at the behest of his stepmother, he's risen beyond any and all expectations. He deserves to be counted amongst the strongest leaders in French history, and he did it all without ever being king. He saved popes, He snubbed emperors, he killed generals, and he allied with monarchs, and was never one himself. In two weeks, we'll look at his legacy. In particular, we'll look at feudalism and how he used and grew it. And then we'll look at his decision to split the kingdom in two for the benefit of the inheritance of his sons Carloman and Pepin. 
Because after a life devoted to basically fixing all of the things the Merovingians had managed to break, Charles apparently wanted to leave the world by doing the most Merovingian thing he could. Now all that's left is to see how the brothers will respond to the temptations that so many others have fallen for in the past, and how long they'll make it before they get pressured to finally end the interregnum and name a king. All of that's coming up in two weeks. Okay, before we go, as always, the music used for the show comes from Josh Woodward and includes his songs Bully and Lafayette. For a free download of these songs or hundreds of other great tracks, check out his site at joshwoodward.com. Notes on this episode, an updated monarchy tree, our Instagram feed, and a list of other great history podcasts are all available online at thugsandmiracles.com. Check out the site and also make sure you sign up for the mailing list. Thank you so much to Judith Stowe for having done exactly that. Speaking of email, you can write to us at thugsandmiracles at gmail.com. You can hit us on Twitter at thugsandmiracle with no S on the end. Or you can leave a comment on Facebook and Instagram at thugsandmiracles. Remember to check out and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're trying to get better and better with videos, and we've had some great back and forth in the comments, so check it out. And if you want to be as awesome as awesome can be, please take a few moments to leave the show a five-star rating and review on your podcatcher of choice. Taking the time to let the world know that you enjoy the show would be an amazing honor for us. Okay, know that we're constantly writing, researching, and recording to bring you all sorts of the medieval content you love. There's honestly nothing quite as cool or as humbling as knowing that there's a whole community of people out there who are just as into the Middle Ages. With that said, be sure to check out the Kindle Vela app for our foray into fiction and we'll let you know more about our courses on academia.edu in just a little while. We're growing, and it's all thanks to you. With that, my name is Benjamin Bernier. We'll be back in two weeks with the next episode of Thugs and Miracles.